We're just hours away from the elections in Germany and the tensions and the excitement are mounting. Hello and welcome everybody to our election debate from the European Parliament, the heart of democracy in Europe. Thank you for joining Euronews and Debating Europe. I'm Stefan Grober. And I'm Caroline Will. There's so much to say about Germany going to the polls this year. It's the biggest country in the European Union and therefore the election outcome will have an impact on the rest of Europe. It's the first time ever in post-war Germany that the incumbent is not running. And, according to polls, a huge number of German voters are still undecided. We're going to break it all down for you from a European perspective with great guests, members of the European Parliament, guests who will join us remotely and with input from young Europeans from across the continent who told us about their expectations, their hopes and their worries. Caroline, tell us more about these youngsters and their opinions. Thanks, Stefan. Yes, indeed. We have talked to students at the Free University in Brussels. They came from the UK, France, Belgium, and they were quite outspoken when it comes to what they expect from Germany. Let's have a listen. I'm uh, very confident for, <laughs> for Germany. I think they will do a nice, nice job for the, <laughs> for the future. Personally, I really liked uh, Angela Merkel. But uh, yeah, for now it's it's uh, I prefer Germany to France uh, in the in politics. Okay, yeah. Angela Merkel has been doing a good job, and she's still pretty popular despite like the IFD and all the like right wing parties coming up. Germany really needs to lead the way towards a just green transition. But if it's like a green red coalition, it would be good if they like take on a more leading role, maybe regarding climate as well. Germany is like the biggest country in Europe for me, like in the economy and everything. So yeah, it's a really important country and. For Europe, everyone needs to know about Germany, I think, yeah. For me, Germany kind of is the EU right now. It's, it's dominant. It is the industrial power that is kind of leading the EU. And so it has a very significant role to play um, in, the whole, in, in the politics of Europe. Quite some interesting statements here. Germany being the EU and Germany urged to play the leading role in Europe. This is the right moment to bring in our guests, and here they are, from Greece, Eva Kaili, a social democrat, from France, Gwendolyn delbos Corfield, uh, representing the Greens, and last but not least, from Romania, Vlad Gheorghe, representing the Renew Europe group. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for joining us uh, for this debate. Now, before we're going to comment on these statements that we've just heard, I'd like you to tell us about your personal experience with Germany. Is there anything that has marked you as a student, as a professional, or as a politician um, when it comes to Germany? And Gwendolyn, I want to start with you. You're from France, Germany's biggest friend. Um, tell us about your personal experience with Germany. Well, when I was a kid, I was at 10, I went to East Germany uh, before the wall fall. My city uh, next to Paris in the suburb was a communist city and it were, had a partnership with Brandenburg. So I went through Checkpoint Charlie at night as a kid. I saw the empty shops, that sort of thing. So that's my first big memory. And then today, of course, I've got strong links and friendship with a lot of um, Greens, political Greens, uh, that I'm very close to. All right. Eva. A similar adventure? Well, I have been uh, at the same places, uh, but I think uh, what marked uh, uh, what I feel and my approach to German politics is uh, as a Greek, what happened during the economic crisis and uh, the mistakes that they acknowledged they did uh, concerning our economy and uh, the support and the solidarity we needed to see from our allies. And I think. Although uh, they made these mistakes, this led into a stronger Europe, the need to have a stronger EU. And I hope that uh, with these elections, we will manage to have a, a better, more European approach, a more European government. And Vlad, what's the Romanian perspective here? Well, it, it needs to be a personal perspective. And uh, I need to tell you that my first uh, trip uh, as an adult at 18 years old, after the visa waiver uh, for Romanian citizens, that was, if I'm not mistaken, immediately after we entered the European Union, I went to Germany. And it was, for me, it was something natural because I didn't need, I need, didn't need any visa just with my ID card. And for the guys who were with me and my family also, it was something 
super hot because they didn't need any visa and uh, super super checks as they did before. So I, I could say that I'm a, the first generation entering Germany without the need of a visa from Romania and hopefully I will get to see the Schengen area extended to all over Europe. Let's go back to what we've heard from these young Europeans and their statements. Uh, some of them clearly expressed their opinion that they want Germany to play a bigger role. Does that surprise you? And, and, and um, do you agree with that? Let's start with... Uh... Um, a bigger, a better, I would suggest. Uh, so I think that for the time being, we all consider that Germany has a very strong position in the EU and trying to, uh, to lead, but in a German-centric way. I believe to become more European would be essential for the, uh, for the future of Europe. And, um, for example, having a European army is something that the, the new government would have to respond to, in, hopefully in a positive way, as we saw our shortcomings in the international and foreign policy of not having um, a, a united position uh, from, you know, around especially our neighbourhood and the Mediterranean, but also what happens in Afghanistan requires a European response. And we don't have that. We have the German response, we have the France response, but we definitely need to have the European voice. OK, a bigger role for Germany, Vlad? Well, in Romania also we see Germany as a big powerhouse and a, a big player in uh, European uh, politics. But I think that uh, we need to be bolder. I think that we need to look ahead. So Angela Merkel was seen as the politician, uh, as the stable politician, the definition of stability. But I think that new times need new ways of doing business. And I think this is also valid for, for this case. And uh, very important is the rule of law in the European Union and the way that we treat uh, uh, problems with the rule of law in the, in the countries and I think again we need to be bolder in addressing important topics as environment and also of foreign policy topics. Gwendolyn, stronger Germany with or without France? Well, I'm always annoyed when we, we put too much emphasis on the German, Franco-German couple. I think that uh, Europe should be about everyone and every country uh, and member state should have a place in it. And I, I'm always a bit annoyed where, when we only insist on this couple. But of course, uh, the, the, the population of Germany, the strength of Germany has an impact that cannot be uh, escaped. Um, so how Germany will uh, choose things on climate issues, for example, will have a huge impact. We really need them to be at the forefront of that fight. We also need them to be more uh, involved in the rule of law aspects. I really insist on that. When it was German presidency, I did ask Angela Merkel to become a bit more serious on this. I think it's, it wasn't enough. I think we need more uh, strong Germany uh, with, with their neighbours like Hungary and Poland. And then, of course, we need to think about the German economy that is today maybe sometimes uh, preempting the other economies to survive. Excellent. You've raised some points that we're going to uh, talk about later in the show. Um, we've heard from young Europeans, and now we want to find out what young Germans want and how they see the election. And for this, let's cross over to Caroline. Caroline, you have some interesting data for us. Tell us about them. Thanks, Stefan. So at Debating Europe, our citizens' uh, discussion platform, we have talked to 100 young Germans about their expectations for Germany and Europe. So what do they want? So the number one priority for young Germans is combating climate change and they demand effective climate action in Germany and in Europe. But they also really care about what is happening at Europe's external borders and they demand a new refugee policy that is based on humanity and on uh, European values. They also want the EU to be more democratic and provides a sustainable economic prosperity that is actually in line with environmental protection. They also want the EU to be a pioneer of fair international cooperation and in line with that, they also demand greater solidarity between uh, people and countries both inside and outside of uh, the EU. So, lots of expectations. Let's see what the new German government will make of them. Stefan, back to you. Yeah, thank you, Caroline. Uh, quite some expectations here of the future uh, German government, which will not be headed. Uh, by Angela Merkel for the first time since 2005. So Germany, a leading role. Under Angela Merkel, have we seen the maximum of German engagement? Vlad. I think 
I think we can see more again. I think we can see bolder actions and talking about the last debate that, uh, that we saw in uh, between the three main candidates in Germany, we saw the fact that there isn't so much uh, talking about the state of the European Union, how everything will go uh, beyond Angela Merkel within the European Union, the talk about Germany, where, where is Germany going to be, and also we didn't see enough foreign policy subjects. So we see what the people want, we saw earlier this. Uh, this. These are the subjects, but we didn't see that too much talking between the main can candidates. So again, yeah, Germany can do more. Again, rule of law, we're talking about uh, we have the Green Deal now, we need to check where that money is going, we need to check that this, that money is used the way it should be used, and again, we, I think we need to think about a European Green Prosecutor, which could supervise the way that the money is being spent, and I think that that could be a future idea of going forward with this, and maybe a German, a German one. So, um, young Germans clearly want a stronger role here for, let's say, what they say are good causes, right? Um, at the same time, there was virtually no talk about uh, Europe in the election campaign. Gwendolyn, what do you make of this? What do you make these, of these uh, objectives here? Well, I think that uh, it's, it's very interesting and it's the same in each member states. We have the young generation asking for stronger Europe, um, for climate <laughs> We all, we all uh, um, uh, 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 as a huge target, the principal target, we, we, we see youngsters ready to welcome refugees. And of course, our member states and our politics in member states are not at all listening to that. Um, and I think it's, it's not a surprise that there was no talk about Europe because I think for the moment, the member states are the conservative, rigid uh, uh, structures in the European Union. Uh, and this is a bit sad. Um, and I think that they should listen to the young generation more. But we still see that, yeah, in a lot of our member states, it is the conservative lines that is still there, even when it's uh, not just the Conservatives themselves, but it's, for example, the Social Democrats. Uh, I, I really hope that the Social Democrats will get out of coal in Germany, but they still not have engaged clearly on that, for example, and, and we need coal to get out of Europe. Uh, of course, with the transition, uh, it, we need the member states to be able to adapt to it, but we need a huge, uh, uh, huge help yeah. for these member states to get out of coal. Eva, you're the, the social democrat um, at this table here. Um, a stronger role for social democratically led government in Germany? I think so, and I hope so. And we saw that uh, recently we have more and more governments becoming social democratic, and I hope that this wave will also um, manage to control also the, the German politics and uh, lead the agenda. Uh, also because he committed actually to the climate targets, but uh, he said he will uh, move towards this direction, but I think he set the target for 2039. Um, uh, but still, uh, he, um, I think, sold um, committed to achieve that. Also, he committed to increase the minimum wage and uh, to build more houses with control rental, uh, I think 30% for uh, young people or elderly or people in need. And I think one, um, I met Solz uh, once, um, three, four years ago in Hamburg, where he was very appreciated as a mayor. And I remember I asked why, uh, because they were telling me he seems very, um, uh, let's say stable and not uh, the charismatic uh, leader that you would expect. So what people like was that he delivers what he promises. And I think this is what also Germans want and I think that uh, the Europeans would want that too. So if he managed to deliver his, his stable and he has a more generous approach also towards the other member states, something that we didn't see, mm -hmm. we saw that uh, the reputation of Germany among other member states was not at its best with Schäuble's tough politics and tough austerity measures, I think this could recover also the position of Germany in the EU. OK. So obviously, the role of Germany in Europe is being debated not only in the rest of Europe, but also in Germany among Germans themselves. The question whether Germany should take on more responsibility and be the political leader of Europe. Caroline, you have more for us on this. Are Europeans and Germans on the same page here? 
Thanks, Stefan. They are indeed, but not quite like you might expect. So uh, across Europe, 34% of people believe that Germany's so-called golden age is in the past. 35% don't know. Um, and uh, uh, whereas 21% believe that Germany is currently in its golden age and 10% believe that its golden age is yet to come in the future. So what's interesting here is that Germans themselves are actually the most pessim pessimistic about Germany's status. Uh, with more than 50% of Germans believing that its golden age is in the past and only 9% believing that its best days are yet to come in the future. Italy is maybe the most torn country, with 37% believing Germany's heyday being in the past, while at the same time almost a quarter of all Italians believe that Germany is currently in its golden age. And as you can see, um, in the Netherlands and in France, comparatively fewer people believe that Germany's best days are in the past. But with only 6% uh, of Dutch people saying that Germany's uh, golden age is still to come, the Dutch are actually the, mo the least convinced that Germany will have a bright future uh, ahead. While more French people believe that Germany is currently at its peak. So, some striking numbers, and I'm curious to hear what our guests will say. Stefan? Yeah, Caroline, thank you for this, um, uh, these insights. Uh, Germany in decline, um, quite some um, interesting perception here. Um, is Germany in decline? Quick answer, yes or no, Vlad? Well, I, I'm, I don't think that we're talking about a decline. I, I'm, I think I we're talking about perspectives and um, it's uh, the COVID crisis, we're just, I've hopefully we're over the COVID crisis, even though now we're experiencing a fourth wave. And you need to, to take in that into account when you're asking people uh, stuff like this really important stuff ab about the future. But I think we need to have th the fact so that... So that's a no, right? So th that, that's <laughs> a long no. <laughs> okay. That's a long no. But I think we need to see this as something for the future because there is a, a place enough to, to improve. Okay, Eva. So uh, I think uh, maybe in terms of leadership, uh, Merkel is a, a strong leader, very popular, especially among women. And I think in this case, we have kind of, you could call it decline, but not in general. It's a superpower, of course, with the industry and all the economy um, uh, being very strong during difficult times. I think it will also survive the pandemic. And uh, just a final quote from Merkel, she said, even Germany cannot figure it out alone uh, in this pandemic, so we have to work together. Okay, Gwendolyn. No, um, but of course, as uh, Eva said, I suppose the people also identify themselves at the with this end of era of Angela Merkel, mm -hmm. and indeed she was a great leader. Um, and also there is a problem of young generation in Germany. There's not enough young people, um, so they need to welcome more migrants. Um, and also we have the problem of, of, once again, this economy that is very strong, but it's sometimes very strong against the other European economies. And I, and I guess that they understand now that that has come to an end and that they will not be able to continue in that way uh, you know, having all the others buying what they export, but themselves not giving back. OK. So, on this issue of Germany's role in Europe, we wanted to know from young Europeans where exactly Germany should offer leadership. And Caroline, you have some interesting things to tell us. So, our Debating Europe community sent us many questions on a great variety of European topics, but one question that kept coming up was the democratic backsliding in some parts of Europe. And our reader Martin from Romania has a question on this, uh, has a question on this for our guests. How they tackle issue of the liberal governments as are currently in Poland and Hungary, and possible other future illiberal governments that are opposed to cooperation across Europe. So the question of how to deal with countries who show disrespect for the rule of law and for democratic values is, is not a, a question that, that concerns Germany alone, it concerns uh, the rest of Europe as well. But in our context here, should Germany, can Germany do more to rein in countries like Poland and Hungary? Gwendolyn. I, I think all member states can do more. I think there is, uh, we have come to a, to a very specific moment in the European Union story where in the next presidency, the French one, we will need 
the member state, the council, to take a position on Hungary and Poland, and this has, becoming, has become press, present, and we know that some countries are really ready to go for. Germany is one of them, but it's not leading it, and it should be as the others. It's not just rule of law, it's not a topic important only for fin Finnish people and Dutch people, it's also important for French and Germany, and we would have liked to see them mm. more outspoken on this. And also, of course, Germany itself has a problem to resolve because the workshop is in Hungary and in Poland. They have very uh, um, ancient diplomatic and business uh, relationship with Hungary and Poland. That means that sometimes they were a bit ambiguous. I think they need to come out of this ambiguity. Yeah. Is, is that a leverage that Germany should pull? Well, first of all, I think that it's, it's a common problem and we all need unity to resolve it. It's not about Germany, Romania or France or just one nation. It's about the whole of Europe. But yeah, we need to do more. Uh, the, the time for, uh, I don't know, old diplomatics, in my opinion, uh, is at an end. So we postponed and postponed a really, really real response to this really super problem. And I think the time to act is now. And yeah, Germany could again lead this response, but the response should be European. We all need to respond to, to this. And we have the response here in the European Parliament. We already voted on that. Eva. Well, I would add to that, that we have also to avoid double standards because this is an hypocrisy that Europe uh, usually has to um, explain. Uh, there are strong national interests and economic ties, as it was very well said. And I think this has uh, actually uh, been in the way of having a European response in several other matters inside our borders, but also outside. So I think um, if we stop doing business as usual and we choose our allies, um, not based on human rights or rule of law, but on our economic ties, then let's be honest, at least uh, among us, and not try to, to defend uh, something different. Uh, I believe that in order to move forward, though, we have to have respect of human law, of, of rule of law and human rights um, higher on the agenda. And Germany, of course, because of its very strong economic ties with several countries, has a leading role to play. All right. Now, there's one issue where many people want Germany and Europe to do more, and that is the fight against climate change. Obviously, a big campaign topic in Germany as well. And now let's bring in Carla Rinsma, who joins us from Berlin and who is one of the leading climate campaigners for Fridays for Future. Welcome to our debate, Carla, and good to have you on. So before we go into details here, um, let me ask you whether you were satisfied with the role that climate policy played in the election campaign in Germany. I'm definitely not happy with the role that climate politics played during the election campaigns. What we've seen is that on the one hand side, all of the candidates and political parties talked about climate quite quite a lot. We've seen there's like basically no street in which there's no um, election campaign sign um, mentioning climate. So there's a lot, a, lot, a lot of talks about going on about climate, but at the same time when it comes to the actual substantial measures the po political parties propose, there's not a single party whose uh, measures and proposals are consistent with the 1.5 deg degree target. And that is, especially after the ruling of the Constitutional Court in May, in which the Constitutional Court said Germany does not do enough um, in regard to climate politics and is disregarding the rights um, of future generations, that is definitely a scandal that there is no political party doing enough um, in regard to the Paris Agreement. All right. I want to bring in uh, Caroline again. Um, Caroline, how important is this climate issue for uh, young Europeans? What did you hear? So, as we mentioned before, uh, climate change is the most important issue for young Europeans and our community is no different. Um, and what they are particularly interested in is um, what exactly the new German government will do uh, to tackle climate change and what concrete steps they want to take to reach the EU uh, Green Deal's climate targets. And we have a question from Erika on this topic. If Germany gets a conservative government, do you think that the 40% greenhouse gas emission reduction target will be achieved? 
Yeah, she says 40 percent, or I think she means 55 percent. Um, and uh, she asks whether conservative government will tackle the climate issue um, seriously enough. Of course, there might not be a conservative government after um, election day, but, but, you know, in general, do you have the impression that Germany is pushing this issue um, seriously enough? Eva. I think all the governments do. I think it's now very high in our priorities also at the European level. So I believe that since we connected the, um, the Resilience Fund to uh, these uh, targets, to the green and the digital agenda, basically, I think they will do their best. And we already tried to um, include all the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals and the green agenda in everything we do. We also suggested several pilots to monitor um, how the budget is being spent and also we have some um, um, safeguards like 2030, 2040, so we would not expect to reach yeah. the end of the agreement until we see if we have results. But we will try also to, um, to achieve more in advance. And you saw already that the green movement is very strong in Germany and I think they will have to follow that also in France. Um, so I believe, um, uh, I believe that the way uh, to go is only through a green transition and sustainable understanding and mindset. Okay, let's head back to Carla um, in Berlin. Is, is Germany in the driving seat here or is Germany uh, driven? Is Germany doing enough on this issue? Germany is definitely not doing enough. We do have the situation that, as I mentioned before, the Constitutional Court just said that the um, climate targets, targets are not enough. We're looking at the coal phase out, which is now set for 2038, which is too late if Germany actually wants to do what is needed to stick to the Paris Agreement. We do have the transport sector in which the emissions have not have been steady over the past 20 years. They did not decline, um, except for 2020 because of the COVID pandemic. So we do definitely see whilst Germany does feature itself as being a climate leader, we do have definitely a lot of ambition lacking right now um, when it, in regard to the measures. We're talking a lot about climate, but the measures are definitely not enough. Gwendolyn, the Greens might be running big parts of the next German government. Um, are you hopeful that this uh, will lead to a, a stronger uh, impetus here? Yeah, I, I hope Greens um, can come in a number of governments. We are the ones that are always pushing the most. Um, I mean, as it has very well said by the, the young woman, uh, this young woman, I mean, the, the, the goals are always very good, but then when, when there's an evaluation, be it by our own structures, European structures, or be it by think tanks, they will always show that the results are not there. Uh, indeed, there's been a big um, fall in... in, in in emissions uh, during the pandemic, but we see that they are going stronger now that economy is going back. So there is really big change to be done in economy. And this is uh, courageous decisions that a lot of governments have difficulties to do. Uh, we don't, uh, we, we, we are used to not be popular and we are used to take decisions that are more courageous than others. So I do hope that Greens will be very, very uh, present in a number of government because what I've seen during all the years is that we are always the only ones that really act. Uh, not even when we are there, it's enough. She's right. Okay. And we are already yeah. running late. That's true. Vlad, do you agree? Well, I think that the social pressure is high enough so that the environmental topics will go uh, in the top row of the agenda of any government. I don't think that it's going to matter so much uh, which political alliances are going to form the government. Again, the social pressure in the whole of Europe and in Germany, uh, the same, is uh, it's high enough so that these policies will get the, for, the front row, the, the front seat to, to any, of any government. But we also need to see the fact that Europe is leading in green technology. This is one of the few things that in which we are world leaders now. And I think that the industry for which Germany is really uh, well known about, I think that the industry through investments can help achieve these, uh, these climate goals. And uh, Carla, Carla, you've heard from three important members of parliament here. Does that um, make you hopeful? 
politicians say over and over again, again that they want to do more in regard to climate change and climate politics and that they find what we do so inspiring. But what we don't see is actual Im climate politics, which is ambitious enough to actually tackle the climate crisis, to treat it as a crisis and to limit global heating to 1.5 degrees, which is existential in regard to safeguard our living conditions um, for our society. And this is why it, what politicians say does not make me hopeful. It is what I see on the ground when I see hundreds of thousands of people going um, to climate strikes, um, going to protests and demanding a safe future and climate justice for all. Um, and it's not about what politicians tell us because they've been telling us over and over again. And we've realized that the change will come from okay. the people and not out of the parliament. Okay, uh, Carla Rensma from Fridays for Future. Thanks a lot for being with us today. Uh, in our debate. So, when we talk about climate policy, we also talk about the economy and the huge economic transformation that is part of the EU New Deal. Europe needs Germany as an economic powerhouse. That was at least the opinion voiced by young Europeans. Right, Caroline? Indeed, Stefan. Many young Europeans know um, of Germany's position as uh, a European powerhouse, um, economic powerhouse, but they also believe that with that economic, economic power comes a responsibility. And now they are wondering how the effects of the pandemic will uh, affect uh, how Germany supports other EU countries. And we have a question from Enchi, from our community, from Italy, uh, on this for our guests. What will happen with the uh, European Union uh, economy uh, after the COVID-19 crisis? Are there uh, chances to grow uh, stronger or weaker? Uh, Germany is a very important and powerful country of the European Union. Will uh, Germany continue to, to uh, support, to be a supporter for other uh, European countries? So will Germany be a supporter of smaller countries in Europe? We can probably say, well, does that mean that um, Germany will keep uh, um, uh, carrying its, uh, its burden um, on behalf of other Europeans? Uh, will Germany stick to austerity or is that obsolete after COVID? Uh, Eva, your thoughts? First, we have to see what the new government will be. Um, but for the time being, the agreement for the Resilience and Recovery Fund is that basically Eurobonds, that all the countries will contribute more in order to reduce the inequalities that might rise uh, after the pandemic. And this means that for the first time, Europe has been uh, showing solidarity and um, we are not facing this alone, speaking also as a Greek. Um, hopefully, we will have a social democrat uh, to lead this government and then we will see even more um, ambitious uh, targets. Plus, I didn't mention that we just uh, received the Fit for 55, which is the uh, legislative files and the opinions that we have in the industry committee on how we can achieve the climate um, changes and the, and the targets we have. So it's not just talking, it's like specific actions and legal actions. And I think we are all committed, so whoever participates, especially Germany, um, to fulfill these targets. So Germany's power to the benefit of the rest of Europe, Vlad? Well, our economies are interconnected. There isn't any more a German economy versus a French economy versus a Romanian economy. Everything is tied, is connected all together, and it's a really good thing. But the leaders in Germany, or again in France, or whatever, but we're talking about Germany now as a powerhouse, need to understand, and I think that they did understood, the fact that we are strong as our weakest link. So we need to have these investments talking about the Green Deal, Fit for 55, we need to have investments in technologies to go greener and greener. And I think that there is enough room for every European country uh, to, to, to take part in this. So again, a leader will not leave anyone behind. And now we're talking about Germany, who shouldn't leave any country behind in this effort to go forward. And one, one final thing. Uh, so the recovery fund is the biggest such initiative since the Marshall Fund. So since the war, the great, the, the Second World War, this is the biggest thing ever. We need to put this uh, into action. And the, I, I'm sure that this is going to work again for every country in the European Union. Gwendolyn. 
It was a surprising uh, remark. I, I'm not sure Germany's economy always supported the others. I think uh, during the great crisis, we saw that it was the contrary. I think we have now come to, and Eva spoke about it very well, we are now come to this common uh, conscious that we needed to, to be solid and to find solutions together. This is a, a huge improvement. Uh, but yes, the, the, the growth of Germany was sometimes done by the sacrifice of other economies around them, but also by some sacrifice by the population. The social situation in Germany is very bad. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, the deregulation of, of, of working laws is, is, is bad. So we hope a big change on this. Um, and so for the future, we can hope two things. We can hope that this solidarity is still there and that we go on having European funds that are made on a solidarity idea, like the recovery fund was done. But we can also hope that Germany will stop thinking that austerity is, is the priority, especially on investment in environmental economy. Uh, we really need uh, on, on infrastructures, on, on social aspects and on environmental aspects, we need austerity to be lifted. Uh, we need the, the rule of, 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 um, of uh, the, the, the economical rule, that a percentage of this deficit that Germany has always fighted for to really be relieved on that, these very specific investments that are important for the future. All right. I said at the beginning of the show that for the first time in Germany, the incumbent is not running in this election. Angela Merkel is retiring after 16 years in office. So we can't really finish this debate without talking about her legacy. And uh, we wanted to hear from someone who knows her very well. Take a listen. I, th I think her biggest failure was the reluctance uh, she sh showed during the Greek uh, crisis because, uh, because of her hesitations and of her reluctance, we were losing time. Greece could have been helped uh, earlier. But finally she gave in and she, she, she made a European choice on Greece. The biggest achievement, to my view, was uh, the role she played during the refugee crisis back in August, September 2015. She is a Christian Democrat, as I am, and she said, OK, these are poor people, we have to help them. And she was doing that against a majority of the German public opinion and against a majority in her old parliamentary group, CDU, uh, CSU. A leader is someone who can say no to his own camp. That was, of course, Jean-Claude Juncker, the former president of the European Commission. Um, what do you make of his statement? Eva, you were nodding when he talked about the Greek crisis. Yes, I have to agree, because everybody admitted that they did mistakes uh, with how they approached Greece and that they didn't show solidarity. The austerity measures were very hard. And um, since Merkel is also a centrist and a pragmatic politician, but Schäuble's influence was, re was really strong at that point. Um, so I think this is something that will follow her legacy, um, the, the mistakes that took place when Europe should show solidarity. I hope that the next government will agree to have maybe a European finance minister that will be able to have um, a European the ESM, uh, the, uh, the IMF of Europe, that will be able to help countries in need in a different way. And I still hope that the Growth and Stability Pact will uh, delay, it will not come back in 2023 because um, it's all about the people, it's not about the numbers, and it's a European Union, not a European market, where the South is just the market for the North. I think if we change this mindset and mentality, uh, we can see a more strong Europe. And um, in this global competition, uh, we cannot afford to have increased inequalities between us. We have to remove all these barriers and, and manage to have common policies. And on migration, he mentioned migration as her biggest uh, achievement. Do you agree? Uh, I agree that uh, we needed to have help because the flows that and the burden that Greece and Italy took was uh, really unbearable during the crisis. So for us, it was very important. And I think still Europe needs to be um, more decisive and create legal ways for the people that deserve to have asylum and 
change the procedures because to, to consider that the European borders uh, are not the Greek borders, um, this sends all the, the burden just to the south. And I think the Dublin reform that passed the European Parliament, it was very ambitious, should pass the Council. And I hope with the next government in Germany and France, we will manage to have uh, a new reform for a common migration policy, finally. Gwendolyn, on Merkel's legacy, I think she lived through four French presidents, right? Yeah, I think um, it's, uh, it's quite an inspiring legacy. Um, and, and, of course, we do not belong to the same camp at all. And she's a conservative. Uh, but uh, I think um, in France and, and probably in the South also, we would have liked sometimes to have some of our right-wing people um, uh, being so um, honest and, and probity. Uh, uh, I think we have a huge problem of corruption sometimes in the conservative uh, people in some of our member states, and she was another example of that, and that, that's a very big legacy. Of course, I talked about the fact that she welcomed refugees uh, when France, for example, didn't take its part. Um, Germany was the only one to take its share and indeed uh, we need to go to a quota system where all countries take their share and, and Germany has been saying that when sometimes others were not and I hope they will not come back on that. Um, there's been a legacy on environmental aspects too because she was one of those that managed to go further than, than others uh, on the nuclear situation, of course. Uh, now, once again, she has, for me, a really black spot uh, in, in, her, in her legacy on the social aspects, I've said it. Okay, Vlad. So, uh, I'm sure that when you, uh, when you talk to someone, to a, any European citizen, and you say Merkel, the first thing that comes to mind is stability. So, for sure, a great politician and super stability. But, again, as we heard Mr. Juncker, mm -hmm. she was right when she was bold, I quote. And I think the next leader should be bolder for really, really different and problematic times. And I think, again, that we should be bolder in, in uh, stuff like um, rule of law matters and, of course, on green matters. So bold, again, was right, and we need that to go further. OK. Now, we've almost reached the end of this debate, but before we go, I would like to test your... Uh, betting power. So give me a quick answer here. Um, uh, rapid fire, as we call it. Who is going to be the next Chancellor of Germany? Eva. I think it's Olaf Scholz and uh, I think the Greens will be uh, a part of this government. Okay. Wendelin, can you live with that? Yes, I, I mean, I think we're going to this sort of configuration indeed. <clears throat> I think also we will probably do a better result at what is for the moment polled because Greens at the moment in most of the countries are always underestimated in polls and, and so I think it will be a bit better than what we are seeing at the moment. Okay. okay. Vlad, the last word goes to you. Let me be the, the other voice in the room and say Armin Laschet and um, let's see what happens because it's a really, really interesting election. It's, it's really neck to neck now uh, for the first time in many, many years. So. Let's see what happens. And uh, I, I think that Germany is still going to be a huge player in the European Union. But again, they need to see the European Union more united and less so as a single player union. All right, that does it for us today. Now we're even more excited about the German elections. Thanks to Eva Kaili, Gwendolyn delbosk Kofield, and Vlad George. You were a great guest. Thanks a lot for being here. A big thank you to Caroline Will and our partners at Debating Europe. Thank you to the European Parliament at last for hosting us. We will be covering all aspects of the German elections before and after Election Day. Thank you for watching. I'm Stefan Grobe. Stay with us.